I'm a grab a snack Can't even listen to Catholic crack Grab the grocery, grab a beer Can't even listen to Catholic cheer Not too holy, not too mad Sharing faith and fun with an Irish Catholic dad It's the Holy Joe Show Welcome to episode 3 of the Holy Joe's podcast. We've got an exciting show today with a special guest, Eddie Cotter, all the way from America, an update on Dermot's rap problem, and we also hear an interesting story about meatloaf. So grab a cuppa, grab a snack, come and listen to some Catholic crack. Welcome everybody to episode number 3. Um, on today's episode, we're welcome a dear friend to Ireland, um, great youth minister and interesting character, Eddie Cotter. So we'll hear more about him shortly. But I would like to welcome the co-hosts, um, Dermot and Matthew. And we can hear Matthew's smoke alarm battery needs replaced as well. So welcome, Dermot and Matthew. How hey, Joe. You, how you doing? Thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm setting up a, a crowdfund. If anybody would like to make donations to a new smoke alarm battery, um, I'd be really grateful. All joke aside, Matthew, you should really change it. Do you not hear that advert? What was thumbs up on Mondays, was it? Yeah, well, I do have... The, the truth is I have a an electric smoke alarm wired through the house. That was just an additional one, um, and it's right beside the, the other one as well. So... Um, but yeah, I do. I appreciate that. I, I I will get a change, Joe. I think there's thumbs up Tuesday, thumbs up Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. Friday. It is actually quite annoying. Um, mm. But I apologize. But it, it, it probably won't be the only annoying thing today. Look, <coughs> guys, we're we're new to this podcast. The concept of the Holy Joes is, if you are a man with faith in Ireland, at some stage in your life, you'll be called a Holy Joe. Um, or if you're a man that blesses himself, says we prayer, you're a holy Joe, regardless if your name is Joseph or not. Um, so we're on podcast three and we're having a bit of banter and some discussion too. What's your thoughts since the last time? I know in the first episode, Dermot, you had a bit of a rap problem. What's the update there? The update, Joe and, and the rest of the guys and, and our listeners is that, uh, yeah, I took a bit of advice from, from yourselves the last time, a bit of time of reflection to think about what the approach would be with my rat problem. But um, yeah, and in these times, I think we notice uh, the sound of the birds more, the beauty of, of nature a wee bit more. And we also notice a rat going around your garden a little bit more as well. So um, yeah, it, it possibly could be still there, but um, keeping a vigil eye to it at this time, Joe, and uh, not gonna kill anything that doesn't need to be killed, but um, we'll look at those options going forward. But All's good and enjoying the great outdoors in these times as well. That's good. Was there not a rumor? Did I not hear a rumor of someone talking about it being a bat? Did you hear that, Matthew? I think it was Dermot himself that mentioned that a um, it was a bat. Now, I'm not sure whether that's a basic primary school English that he's mixing up or a, he can't tell the difference between a rat and a bat. But I know, probably. Maybe, he'll, maybe he'll enlighten us here. Yeah, maybe next week it'll be a ha hat. <laughs> and a cat. It is pr- primary primary one grammar, isn't it? Really, for the boys it really in this is, part yeah, of the world, it really is. It, is. Yeah, it, it rhymes uh, bat with rat, but I also have a bat problem. Well, done. well at night time, uh, Mister Batman comes out uh, and flies around the house as well. But do you dress up in a Batman costume? Is that what you're telling me? Because that's a bit weird. Uh, I think we should we should maybe move into some seriousness. What did you think about Father Connor's episode? He's a lovely guy. It was good to have the youngest priest in Ireland, the youngest PP in Ireland, on the on the show. Yeah, I was struck by, I was actually disturbed uh, by you drinking fig coffee, Joe. What's the crack with that? It's funny they're the things you pick up on, but um, maybe one day I'll, I'll get you some Fortnum and Mason coffee with fig in it. But it is. It's good coffee. You need to appreciate it. And actually now, the show is all about grabbing a coffee, grabbing a snack, and come and listen to some Catholic crack. Grab your rosary, grab a beer. You can grab beer if you want, Dermot. But actually what struck me about Father Connor said was the whole idea at the end, the challenge you give to men about, like, don't let your relationship with Jesus just be something you do 
on a Sunday for one hour or half an hour, like let it be, like bring them to the pub, bring them to the, the GAA ground, the football pitch, mm. the music concert. Um, and I, I think Matthew sort of said that in the first episode about you know, saying God bless the people, just bringing God into every day. And, and that was a real challenge because sometimes you can forget about the God in your, your every day. Yeah, like even there, the the Irish language, you know, the the term Jiaditch, a uh, God be with you. Um, there's even a at this stage, people now that are are starting to have difficulty with that and and, and not use that anymore. And I think it's a beautiful a beautiful greeting for someone. You know, the whole idea of, of God be with you. Um, and you know, we need to use the equivalent in, in English as well. I know I'm certainly very conscious now about how I sign off emails and uh, how when I'm disconnecting from a phone call or, or something like this, you know, just the simple things like God bless and really bringing God back into the, the whole equation. And, and uh, yeah, beyond the, the the Sunday bit, yeah, we'll have to do that. And, and uh, I think people appreciate that too. If you're being real and you're being genuine, I think people will, will appreciate that. Yeah, no, totally. And, and you're right, like a shot of it, the beauty of a language, and I think even just the Spanish as well, the Buenos Dias, that God, many languages do. The first greeting is an acknowledgement of God in, in each other and like to bless the day. So it's just merge you to us all. Um, Matthew, are you going to welcome our next guest? We've got a special guest that went today all the way from some other part of the world. Are yeah. we going beyond the Green Island today? A, a very special guest we have with us today. Um, delighted. Um, it's been a while uh, since I've been in contact with, with this gentleman. And, and, a, and a, a gentleman is definitely the, the term that I would use to, to describe this man. We met many years ago now, going back a lot of years. Um, and we met in a, in a little village uh, in County Mayo called Knock. Um, we were down and we were this a this idea of this project for young people and there was going to be this man here that was going to present this project and um i thought right this sounds good i'll, I'll give this a try so landed down and now i'm a, i'm a big lad but i met another a big lad but a big ginger lad i with a a real deep American accent, and that was the one and only Eddie Cotter. And a, I just immediately warmed to Eddie. Aside from anything that he was doing or anything that he was promoting, you just immediately warm to Eddie. You can feel his warmth, and you can feel this man cares about people. This man is, is passionate about his faith, and this man has, has a lot to offer. And, a, and he's an American, so he has a lot to say as well. So I'd like to welcome you to our, our podcast, Eddie. It's great to have you. And we're looking forward to hearing what you've, what you've got to say to us today. Well, thanks very much, Matthew. It's, it's, uh, it's, been, a, it's been a while for sure. And it's great to see you guys and, and with Dermot and Joe. Uh, I know we go back a number of years now. And I'm, I'm very grateful for the friendship and the times we've had together. And please, God, after this virus passes, we'll be able to meet up in person again. But Matthew, I tried to write down all the nice things you were saying about me so I can use it, you know. <laughs> but but um, hey, if, a ha if half of those things are true, I'm not doing too badly. But uh, it's, it's a great honor in my life to, uh, to be on this podcast. And I was able to listen to the last episode. And uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, Eddie, what, one, of the, one of the my first memories of you is actually we came to Belfast and me and you went out for a bite date. And we went to like, just to paint the picture, we went to like a part of Belfast that was, you're more likely to find a Protestant, like it's pretty much a Protestant union. It was the Shankill Road when we went for a KFC. Oh, and I Eddie does, really doesn't know the, the challenges of the north of Ireland and division. And, um, and I, I, was, I was just going there because I go there myself for a, a wee chicken burger. But when Eddie went in the, the KFC in the Shankill, he does the big, like there was neon <laughs> signs pointing at him saying, can anyone spot the Catholic? And he does the most ginormous, in nomine padre spirit like he, he blesses himself and at that stage like i'm worried second like, oh let's hope um no one noticed that and all i'm thinking is everyone sees that this big massive six foot how, what height are you Eddie? six four when i stand up straight yeah well 
Uh, six and was, eight with the hair. And so it was six and four of, of American Catholicism, and I was scared at it. Um, Why are you, you know, I do remember that because uh, it, we just always say grace before we eat anything here, any meal, any snack, any time, any place. And we've taught our teenagers to do the same thing. So I was aware of, of the history of the trouble of being an Irish American and things, but <laughs> I didn't know my geography. And I remember hanging out with you, Joe. Yeah, I remember that we were chatting away, having a great time. I remember it came time to say grace before the burger, and you went quiet and you changed color. Yeah, totally right. Yeah, when we, it was once you got the rosary beads out and you started put, when the when the incense came out around the burger, and uh, you know, like, and then when all all the nuns started singing around you, you know, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it was a bit yeah. OTT. So, yeah. Eddie, maybe tell us tell us a, a bit about just a bit about who you are. Like, I mean, tell us like, sure. what led yeah. up, what's led up to you being involved in youth youth work. Oh, sure. Well, thank you. I'll give you the the real condensed version here because I don't want you guys to make to miss your great grandchildren's weddings. Um, so I'm I'm basically from Columbus, Ohio originally, um, which is be the Midwest in America. Uh, my dad was Catholic. My mom was Protestant uh, their whole lives. Uh, we grew up um, with a, a very kind of a natural faith, no conflict. Um, my mom sang in her Methodist choir every Sunday, had a great voice, but we always went to mass with dad. And I remember growing up, there was never one time ever in my entire life where there was any kind of argument or anything about religion. So that was kind of the, the, the home that I grew up in with my brother and my sister. Um, Went to school there, went to college at a university at the Ohio State University there in Columbus, Ohio. Got my degree in social work. Had an interest, always had an interest in working with uh, those that were, um, had disadvantages, the kind of the underdogs in life. Um, worked at Catholic Social Services in downtown Columbus for a number of years, working with all sorts of intake, uh, the people living on the streets, people involved in, in drugs and Satanism and gangs, uh, you name it. Um, and loved every minute of it. It was there doing my social work years. I got a call to, uh, uh, to be a, a juvenile court director. So I moved away, went to a kind of a rural community, uh, became the youngest juvenile court director in the state of Ohio's history at age 30. And there I was in charge of, you know, had teenagers who were in trouble in the court system, and I'd make the assessment to the judge, and then had to often time in my caged car, take them off to prison and those kind of things. And it was during that time as a juvenile court director, it was a very prestigious job. Actually, I'd be retiring this year had I stayed with it with the big pension. But the Lord had other things. I remember frequently I would take teenagers who were, uh, I was taking them off to the juvenile prison, and I would stop by the National Basilica of Our Lady of Consolation in a little rural a town called Cary, Ohio, where there were there have been uh, miracles there for well over 150 years. My own aunt was cured of blindness there in the 1930s. So I would take the teens, uh, take them out of the caged car, sometimes undo the handcuffs, and we'd sit in the church. And I would talk to them about, you know, if somehow if you don't live to try to get to heaven when this life is over, all of our court programs, even the best of them, won't make a darn bit of difference in your life. So I told, I'd tell the teens, you know, I may never see you again. I wish you well, but I really do hope, sincerely hope and pray that somehow you can get God working in your life and live for heaven. And then that will make all the difference. Um, so after do, I would do that frequently, even though probably technically I wasn't allowed to, but I did, I just did it because I knew it was more important. And I remember asking God, I would go to this uh, basilica sometimes at two or three o'clock in the morning. It wasn't too far away from where I lived at the time. And I asked Our Lady and, and I asked Jesus, I said, you know, put me where you want me because I would like to advocate for the rest of my life what I know young people need. Um, and it was literally a couple of days later, I got a phone call to go visit a friend of mine in Florida. There I was asked to, uh, uh, there was a priest from Ireland, saw me at the church and said, uh, you look like a fellow who can work with young people. We need a youth minister. Would you be interested? I thought that was a pretty quick response to a prayer that I had. So we sold the house. I moved down to Florida, which was the last place in the world I ever wanted to go because I, I played there as a rock and roller back in the 80s, and it was too hot. 
and I don't know how to swim. And I thought, this place is miserable. But that's where the Lord wanted me to go. And it was there that I started my, my life's work, really, in youth ministry. We had about, oh gosh, probably by the time I left there, we had about 300 teenagers from about 10 different subcultures, a lot of different subcultures of youth in Florida. And uh, had some great successes with young people, even some who were involved in Satanism started coming to Mass. And, and, um, and from, it was there, working there with the young people that this idea for the Apostle, which I've done now for the last 25 years, happened. So that's really, that started my whole career in youth ministry. And I have to say, um, I've never regretted it for a single second, even though, as we all know, we work in this field. There's challenges. Sometimes the challenges can just be covering the bills. You know, it's not a get rich kind of career, but it's it's a very rich life, and it matters. I think the most. I was intrigued there about your uh, about what you were telling us about your juvenile court director days. Uh, I'd love to hear mm. more about that at at, the, at another stage. But it just got me thinking about something somebody in youth ministry said to me when when I, when I began my own journey, and that was that. Sometimes the best ministry is done out in the secular world and is done outside of the, the church context. And when I heard your stories there about a stopping off at the church with the young people, I just thought that's exactly what they meant and exactly what they were referring to. Um, tell us a wee bit about your meatloaf trip or your MTV days. Oh, <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, sometimes people say they call me Forrest Gump because of all the different experiences. Yeah, in the, in the big 80s, I was a, I made my living as a, as a rock and roll drummer with a, a quite, it was a quite a popular band called the Bellows. And we were even, we have our video. We, we were, had a video made in the CD in the early days of the eighties when even a lot of other kind of big name rock bands hadn't gone to CD yet. But uh, we got to open for a lot of fam famous people. Our, our YouTube video, the Bellows, a song called there was a time, I think it has about 5,000 views, but, I think myself and the lead singer account for about 4,900 of those 5,000 views. But uh, yeah, we did open, for, <laughs> we did open a concert for the legendary meatloaf and I was uh, shining up my drum set. We were the support group and uh, the, the, the live television cameras were there and he came out, <laughs> he came out on the stage as a, as a pre-concert interview and he, he kind of clipped the back of my heels. I was kneeling down trying to shine up the drum set and I tripped him. And I remember, I felt bad, so I said, excuse me, Mr. Loaf. And then myself and our bandmates, we all ran back to our dressing room. And they thought that was the greatest thing they ever saw. They said, man, you just tripped Meatloaf. <laughs> I said, well, it was <laughs> accidental. He didn't get hurt. It was, he didn't fall over anything. But, but yeah, he hit the back of my foot. And, uh, but it was, that was a career that lasted, oh gosh. You know, we were in our 20s, and every day was Saturday night to us. When our other friends were off having real jobs that we would kind of look down on um now looking back you know they all were very successful <laughs> where every night for us was saturday night um it was quite a kick but i left the rock and roll and i've had a wonderful life playing actually traditional irish music as a bowron player with a band called the kells and we've gotten to travel and play around the world including rio de janeiro a few years back when pope francis was down there and uh i remember the stage we were on I think Bon Jovi played two nights later. It was massive, three jumbotrons and and tens of thousands of young people from all around the world. So that was pretty cool. And actually my son at the time, he's in his 20s, was our kind of road manager. I remember before that gig, sitting there in Rio de Janeiro, I thought, man, this is even better than all the rock and roll. And I'll never wonder what it was like, what it would be like to play on a massive stage in in, in front of tens of thousands of people like, all the top headline bands because I got to do it playing Irish trad music. So between the rock and roll, the big eighties and Irish trad music, it has been a, a wonderful musical life that I've had in addition to the youth ministry. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for it all really. And Eddie, I don't want to um, bring humility into this now, but I remember you were telling my, my little sister that you were going to Rio to play the Boron for the Pope. And she's like, what does the Pope need a Boron player for? Like what on earth does... <laughs> Yeah, what, and what many, many people ask the same question. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think the way you phrased it, Eddie's going to go play the Bowron for the Pope. Yeah. That's I thought it was in your question. 
And then, yeah, I remember Tasha looking at him. What's a Pope mean with a Bowron player? Um, Eddie, there's a term, and I don't know if it translates in America as it does in Ireland, but the show is called The Holy Joe, The Holy Joe Show. And it's a, it's a collection of it's three Holy Joes. If you're a young man with faith in Ireland, regard if you if your name was called Cuthbert or Ignatius, you mm-hmm. would still be called a Holy Joe. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm just wondering, have you ever been called a Holy Joe in your life, or does the term translate in the states? The term does translate. Um, we, th- I was called a couple times. Uh, I think the term a little more common would be a Jesus freak. Um, Holy Joe, we've certainly heard that term, but I remember once at a, with a bunch of friends from high school, we were all we were all camping out, and we came across some older dudes who were there to check on their marijuana plant harvest. And I remember we sat around the campfire and we were talking about God, and they were very interested. They were kind of blown away by it that there was someone a little bit younger than them, but as, as a teenager, kind of witnessing a little bit. And the guy said. You know, I, I really think you're a Jesus freak. <laughs> you're a Jesus freak. And um, I don't remember how I responded, but I do remember feeling, you know, if I get called a Jesus freak, it's kind of a compliment. I'm, I'm pretty good company. I mean, I, I, I certainly know I have a long, long, long way to go. But what you guys may have heard, they say, you know, if you were accused in court of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> and the fact that if someone calls you Holy Joe or Jesus freak, um, we're in good company with some people who were called a lot worse and paid the price a lot more for it. So, uh, but yeah, the term it's, it's, yeah, you kind of stand out a little bit, even though we've always told our teenagers, like we bless ourselves before we eat, you know, not to do it to show off, but make it sincere. And you'd be amazed um, at times when someone would, would at a restaurant, we could be getting something to eat and, someone would come up and say, Hey, I just want you to know, I saw, I saw you do that. And I needed that. And it gives me a little bit of hope for the world. It's funny. There was, I just found a quote here. Um, it was the great Pope St. Pius X. He said, the greatest obstacle in the apostolate of the church is the cowardice of the faithful. Mm. And I think um, a lot of folks, and we're not all called, I think we have to be prudent at times. Like we're not all called just to go out on the street corner, and start shouting to people. I think there's a, some people may have a gift or a skill for that, but for a lot of us um, may just be in, are we ashamed to talk about God? Are we prepared to talk about God? Are we going to mass? Are we, you know, praying a rosary? Are we trying to just live our faith in a very natural way? And I think there's a lot of cowardice, ignorance and cowardice um, among the faithful where they could just, we could just do some of the most simple things without being afraid. We could start to create a, a genuinely Christian environment again, but there's a lot of silence. And I know in this country, for sure, uh, there's a, there's, well, there's renewed attacks on the church. We've seen it a lot during this coronavirus and from the celebrity world. Um, there's a lot of attack on the church. So, Hopefully, uh, people won't shrink during this time, but that with kind of fortitude and keeping charitable, will not be cowards. Eddie, we're a bunch of dads. Like, what advice you give me about how we deal with anger, how we say sorry to our wife or kids, or even model, like, good fatherhood, being a good dad to our children? When we are in a state of grace, when we go to confession, it's amazing how the temper kind of evens out and we're able to deal with things a lot more when we start getting full of sin and we're afraid or too proud sometimes or just to go to confession to get the cure. Um, we start to act out worse. It's not, it's not our best version of ourselves. So I think there's a definitely a correlation between the sacramental life and the way that we just behave in, in the, in the little things in life. You know, are we going to be, uh, remember St. John Vianney said, anger never travels alone. It's always accompanied by other sins. And I notice, like if I'm in a lot of sin is when I feel like I'm personally inconvenienced. So I get angry about it and then we'll lash out and say something stupid or those kind of things. But I really believe that being in a state of grace through the sacrament of confession, it helps you roll with all just the comings and goings of being a husband and a dad every day. We become a little more patient. We become better humored. Um, and we can even do things like 
you know, stop by a church with our kids and have a little visit for 10 or 15 minutes. So some of those things add up. I always remember my own dad, every single night of his life that I ever saw him, before he would get into bed, he would kneel by the side of his bed and say, and pray for a minute, you know? Um, and I remember I didn't do that until my dad started getting older and I was a father myself. And it's amazing just from that quiet witness of kneeling by the side of the bed for a minute or two. I've adopted that now every day of my life for probably the last 30 years. And I believe my own kids do it. You know, I don't ask them about it much, but um, I think those little simple witnesses go a long, long way. And then you start to put a lot of those little things, you know, you talk about in the, in the area of, of physical health, people want to get in shape, lose some weight, those kind of things. Many uh, health professionals will say, incorporate some little steps first, you know, a little bit of walking, eating a little healthier, do little things. And before you know it, you've accumulated a lot of healthy habits. Spiritually, I think it's the same way. If we can start, if we're not even saying a Hail Mary every day, start by doing one, two, or three. Before you know it, you may do a decade of the rosary. Then building up to doing the, praying the rosary every day will be as simple as you start out walking around the block and then you can do a three mile walk and it's not that big a deal, but you start slowly, but do something a little bit more. And I think being grateful and being aware of the blessings that God always showers upon us is one of the keys to being a better husband and a father. Recognize we can always find things to bitch about. That's easy, but we can also decide, wow, if right now, if all of us, started to say, hey, let's list of things that we're grateful for. Right now, we're able to see each other through the technology. We're able to talk. We can hear. We can see each other. We can have a laugh. We have people that love us, people that we love. We have some things we can do. Most of us are able to walk around still. That We could go on and on and list how many things we could be grateful for. And I think having that um, mentality can go a long way into becoming, into growing to become an authentic Christian, which is... Yeah we all need to strive to do it. I mean, I'm, I'm not where I'd like to be, but, um, but at least being aware that I can maybe do a little bit better today or tomorrow, you know? So. And I think that's, that's, it's, it's, it's a wonderful challenge. I think actually within, within Irish British culture in particular, we kind of have a natural inclination to, to bitch or be negative. And you know, like if someone mm. looks good, they'll be like, what's wrong with you? Or like you know, if, some, if someone's lost weight, you'd yeah. say, "Have you put on a few pounds?" Or you know, you kind of <laughs> yeah. it, it, we throw backhanded compliments. And and you're re, like one of the things I've been honoured in knowing you about is your your joy and your positivity. Like lads, I don't know if I told you this story, but I once made beautiful black currant jam while Eddie was oh. staying at our house. It it was my first attempt, and it, it, the jam probably didn't set quite like a jam would. Actually, to the chewing it felt like chewing maybe like a piece of road, like tar. It was just, it was pull your fillings out. It was that. Um, but Eddie still had the, the, the positivity to recognize it was a unique substance, Eddie. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember it clearly. It was the finest bit of road tar I've ever had in my life. <laughs> the, color, the color was magnificent. The effort the fun we had and even picking the berries and trying to do it. And I think really it's one of those food things. You couldn't really call it jam at the end, but it was its own category. And in some cultures that could have caught on and you could have been a multimillionaire. So um, I remember the experience. Well, I even had pictures of us picking the berries and stuff. I think little Anna, your daughter was with yeah, us. Yeah. We were collecting the berries. But God loves a trier, Joe. God yeah, yeah. loves a trier. Totally. <laughs> Eddie, we'd love to um, move into this part of the, the show um, just to hear a little bit more about your apostolate, uh, Dead Theologians Society, and sure. really the difference that it potentially can make for men. Um, I certainly have had an amazing experience with it. Um, I think I first met you along with, with Matthew in a very small parish centre in, in County Tyrone uh, one evening to talk about this amazing apostolate program. and. Um, you also joined a, a group of some young adults that I had away in training about two years ago. And that was a wonderful experience that we had up in the Moor Mountains that oh, yeah. we were able to use that uh, model of talking about dead theologian society um, to our young adults uh, to help them with their faith life as well. So certainly I'd love to hear a wee bit more about that, 
in these times and during pandemics, you know, I've been really reflecting a lot on St. Paul and his writings and a lot about basic Christian communities in these times as well. Um, and I certainly feel that this apostolate is, is, is an amazing program. So maybe I'd like to share with our, our listeners a little bit about sure. this great program. Sure. Well, thanks, Dermot. Now, just real quick, I remember uh, spending that weekend kind of retreat with you and some like young adult leaders up there. And what's funny is that was the morning I was up early and the only thing that was open, I think it was the anniversary of Fatima. I was, the only thing that was open, I was, I was looking for something to eat. There was a neon sign that said Turkish barber. And I had massive big 80s hair that morning. And I walked in there just trying to get a quick haircut. And I came away when the guy took the, the buzzer, the, the clippers out and went on the side of my head and dropped 30 pounds of hair. And I thought, oh my gosh, shortest haircut I've ever had in my entire life. And that includes <laughs> first grade. And I remember I was so devastated not having my big 80s hair. I sat on a bench looking over the Irish Sea, I think it was, thinking, I just want to disappear for a couple of weeks. I was mortified. And I realized I have to get over myself. <laughs> and so I remember in the back of my mind trying to do that retreat. It's like, wow. And I sent a picture of it to my wife. She wanted to see it. And all the neighbors made photocopies. So when I came home, there were about a thousand copies of me with the, with the buzzed hair all over the neighborhood. So it was tremendous. <laughs> I still find them places. But anyway, moving right along. Um, yeah, DTS, I, it, was, it was at that time in, um, I went to, when I was in Florida working with the, the young people there and the film, uh, so we had teams from all over different subcultures and the film Dead Poet Society was only maybe about five years old. It was kind of a popular film, but we watched it one evening and it triggered a conversation among the teens. Wow, this is pretty interesting. Uh, instead of, but instead of learning about poets and great writers who are phenomenal, what if we learned about the lives and maybe some of the, the writings if there are some or quotes of some of the great saints, because we're all created to become saints. And even if we're not on a medal or holy card, that's the purpose, that's why we were created. So if we live our whole life and don't know about the saints and don't become one, boy, talk about the biggest waste of a super lottery win to get to be a human being in history. So we thought, hey, we'll get together and we'll, we'll learn about some of these saints. And maybe we'll start with where our parishes were named after or, or some of the statues in the churches or just to get to know who these people were and are. Uh, so there was a genuine enthusiasm. They said, what do we call ourselves? And there was a kid of Irish roots like myself. His name was Sheeran was his last name. He said, I know, Eddie. Let's call ourselves the Brotherhood of Mystical Celts. And he leaned back and almost had tears in his eyes. And I said, well, I like the name, but I don't think the Ramirez girl will go for it or the Hammerschlag and twins over there were going <laughs> to buy into it. So but we, we, uh, someone did mention St. Paul says in Romans, be dead to sin, but alive in Christ. So, hey, we are going to learn about the lives of saints who are dead only by the world's definition of dead, but fully alive in heaven, the ability to intercede and pray on our behalf. And so there was such a natural enthusiasm from the young people. Let's learn about these saints. And we'll call ourselves the Dead Theologians Society. Because at that time, you know, Dead Poets Society was still popular. Everyone kind of knew the, the, the connection. But as time went on, that movie's become a thing of the past as, you know, culture moves on. Um, the, the name was kind of becoming a little bit bizarre. But, but this initial idea of let's gather at our parish. And let's learn to pick a saint and learn about what they were like when they were a teenager, how they died, more importantly, how they lived, what their what their story is, was. Um, and so it was from that initial idea uh, that this this dead theologian society and our motto will be dead to the world, but alive in Christ, definitely in the world, but not of the world, that we live for heaven. That's more important, even though we're going to be fully engaged in the world. But try, to, but try to be dead to sin as much as we can in this life, but fully alive in Christ. Well, uh, I got a call then to come to Ohio to a parish to work where uh, there was nothing really happening. You know, they had over 100 years of, of Catholic school and great nuns and all this stuff. But about the priest told me about five to ten teenagers total were coming to all seven masses combined. And at the college age crowd he said, left us years ago. Any, any ideas? I said, well, I do have this idea, this dead theologian society thing. So bottom line is we launched it the first time we just jumped in. And I should say the fact that the priest was behind it 
and myself and other fellow youth minister were behind it. We were all in no matter what. So the first night, I remember 10 teenagers showed up and we read the Didache, the teaching of the 12 apostles. Well, the next week, there were 20 that showed up. The week after that, 25, then 30, 40, 50, 60. We had to find a new space. And we would gather there at the church, and we would pick a different saint. And their stories and their writings were so inspirational. They were so timeless, totally relevant. And the teenagers, for them, they were hearing this stuff for the first time. And pop culture definitely is not serving up this kind of stuff to our young people. And so... The, the, it just kept growing and growing. So now move, we're, we're starting our 25th year as an apostolate. We became an official private association of the faithful. So we have canonical standing now in 2015, in March of 2015. We're canonically anchored in the Diocese of Madison, Wisconsin. We had great support. We've had cardinals, bishops, many holy priests. And we've had probably at this point... Um, we're approaching probably 18 to 19,000 young people who are members of Dead Theologian Society. We've been in over 550 parishes and uh, in about 45 of the United St of the states in the U.S., several foreign countries. We've had chapters there in Northern Ireland and Ireland, and we've had uh, uh, chapters in Germany and the Philippines. At any given time, there could be anywhere from 50 to 100 active chapters because Longevity and success sometimes depends on who's running it. You know, priests get moved around, leaders come and go. But I can say that in the last probably nine months, I've learned of about 15 priests, several seminarians, and a nun who were all in DTS as teenagers in different parts of the country, and they credit their experience in the Dead Theologian Society with inspiring them, and it contributed to their call to the religious life. And I still get invited to many marriages where teenagers met during DTS, and it's phenomenal. Really, only God knows the far-reaching success. And as I talk about the successes, I genuinely mean it's just scratching the surface. We have you know 20,000 parishes just in the U.S., so it's not the cure-all. There's a lot to do. But I will say, as I've said many times, DTS isn't the magic bullet to all the problems of, of youth ministry, but it's definitely one of them because it works simple to operate and it would work in every single parish in the entire world. Um, right now, our materials, of course, are only right now in, in English, um, but any parish in Ireland, DTS will work. And I don't say that arrogantly. I just say it factually because I've seen it. Teens are still teens. People still want to know God. They still want to know about the heroes, uh, the superstars, you know, in sports. If you want to become a professional athlete, you certainly know about certain professional athletes and inspire you. The same in trying to live to become a saint is to know about the lives of saints. So it, it flat out works. Yep. No, and I, I've seen it work, Eddie, actually in Belfast, Antrim, Derry. Arma yeah, and um, Limerick, like in some tough spots. So, yeah, thank you. Anything, Matthew and Dermot, just want to add or ask anything? Or yeah, Addy, I suppose one of the most powerful messages for me today that that you've given out is the the small steps approach to to faith. You know, mm -hmm. you begin with with two or three Hail Marys and you build that up. Um, I think we all tend to to dive in too quickly into things and then. Um, we're not at, at, at the right place and, and abandon them quickly after. So the bite-size yeah. approach is, is something that I really like and something that I love. So um, how could you bring that bite-size approach? If, if somebody's tuning in today and, and they're thinking, do you know what? The lives of the saints are something that I, I could delve into here. How, how could you begin your bite-size approach to, and, and where would you start at it? And what would you advise? Sure. Well, I would say um, if I'm able to give my, I'll tell someone, email me, you know, I'd be happy to, to help advise or steer. We have resources. If a, if a person thought, wow, this would be great for young people at our parish, you know, um, we do have a website, deadtheologianssociety.com. And actually the brand new website is supposed to launch any day now, which will be fantastic. Some of our parts of the current site are antiquated, but 
I'm Eddie at DeadTheologiansSociety.com. That's theologians with an S, so you have two S's in a row there. Um, the other thing is, I will say, there are so many little booklets, even children's books. If, you know, Ireland is still full of religious shops that have all kinds of stuff. But you don't have to get the Thomas Aquinas level stuff if you're starting out. Truly, saint books, children's saint books are fantastic because they tell the story that's kind of positive. They're usually very true and it's a way to share it. <laughs> Just to, you know, you don't have to be PhD level stuff. Um, and Ireland's just full of, of resources. The nice thing with the, the internet is you can look up, you know, if someone said, well, who's the, who's the saint that I'm named after? Maybe I'll find out just a little more about him because we've, we've taken the name of a, of a great saint in heaven. You know, most of us have saint names and, and those, those saints, they, I just want to impress upon people they are not dead. They are fully alive in heaven. And just think on a given day, you might be the only person on planet earth that's asking for the intercession of your patron saint, you know, and I think the graces that they have and the, the assistance that they want to gladly give is just incredible. Um, the other thing I just want to say quickly, I know we're kind of getting near the end of our, of our show here, but a charism, a special charism of DTS is to pray for souls in purgatory. And that's something that many people forget about. Often in November, the month where you remember the dead, people start to pray for them. But it's one of the most important things we can ever do because the church is made up of the church triumphant, those saints in heaven, we're the church militant, those fighting the good fight here on earth, and the church suffering in purgatory. Many of our favorite entertainers, beloved family members, it could be grandparents, great-grandparents, there could be a lot of people we know who have passed who are in purgatory and in great need of our prayers. And it's one of the most charitable, holy, easy things to do is to remember to pray for the dead, not just in November, but for every single day of our life. And our prayers will help those souls get to heaven and be assured when we pray for a soul and that soul gets to heaven, their heart's desire, boy, you can be assured they're going to intercede for us and have our back as we try to, you know, live a holy life here during this time on earth. So, I mean, that's kind of a long answer, but, you know, um, but I would, I would love to hear from folks if they're interested. Yeah, Eddie, I've really, uh, I've, I've got a lot from having here today. So thank you very much for, for being with us. Uh, certainly, I think for, for all of us are those, you know, that are trying their best in faith. And even if you think you're not doing so well in faith, I, I was firstly struck by your experience that you had as a, as a juvenile officer as well. And, and sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sometimes we need to hear that sometimes we, we may not be able to speak about our faith, but our actions can speak louder than words as well. And we might be doing it no yeah. matter what. So stay, stay courageous. I think that's a message as well. And you've shown that and, and you've done that. And, and I, I've taken a lot of strength from that as well. And hopefully our listeners can as well. And certainly going forward for our, our listeners, you can, certainly tune in um, to our podcast which is now available on um, podcasts and all major streams we are also on uh, facebook as well so go over and give us a like and we definitely share more information about eddie as well and our facebook page is the holy joe's podcast hello cool. dermot i got one if i if i may real quickly you talked about the uh, the rat problem just real quick, the, the yeah. patron saint, there's a patron saint that you could ask for his intercession, and I really believe it'll take care of the problem. We had a big mouse problem one year in Wisconsin, and it, we were being overrun. I was almost getting depressed about it. And I remember St. Martin de Poors. He was a great saint. Actually, there's a devotion to him in Ireland historically. He was so good at talking to the animals. He would ask the rats and the mice and the, and the, the wild animals to leave uh, the, the, the seminary or the, the, where he lived because uh, he said they were just hungry, but he asked them to leave. Bottom line is, we asked St. Martin de Poors to please ask our mice to leave the house, and we never saw another one starting from that very day, and we were becoming overrun and very depressed. So St. Martin de Poors is a great saint who I believe will assist you in the humane <laughs> treatment of any problem you may have in that regard. Eddie, if you can, if you can find it, who's the saint that gets rid of, gets rid of eerie wigs and spiders because my wife hates them too. So that's your oh, next yeah. challenge. That's your next challenge. Deal. 
I'll look it up as soon as we sign off here. Eddie, we would love it if you could like finish with a short reflection on Saint and maybe just pray for us all and pray for the listeners. Well, sure. Uh, there's one that I, I love. He just became blessed a couple of years ago. It's, it's Solanus Casey. And I, I know I've shared him with you guys um, when, in, when we've been together. He's, he has his roots in Ireland there. His, um, you know, his, his dad was from Monaghan, Castle Blaney. His grandfather, uh, let's see, his, his mother was actually baptized at St. Mary's in Armagh. So there's his Irish roots. He was always proud of his Irish roots. But he was born himself in Wisconsin, uh, one of six of, uh, there were 16 children in the family. Uh, several died when disease and diphtheria came over. But his grandfather was actually, he was, died from wounds that he received defending the Blessed Sacrament during adoration. Um, and then it's in the Casey's and they came to America. But he grew up as, in a very uh, holy, very Catholic family. Uh, they had a, a baseball team called the All Casey Nine. He played catcher but never wore a face mask. He would make the sign of the cross in front of his face. He went on to, uh, he was one of the first streetcar operators. He was a prison guard at one point. Uh, they were growing up in Wisconsin. Uh, once when he was on the, as a, one of the first streetcar operators in America, he came across a scene that changed his life when there was a drunken sailor who had just murdered a girl on the tracks. And he saw that as a streetcar came to a screeching halt, he said, wow, here are a couple lives that are, that are just changed forever. And he, and he said, I have to do something with my life more than what I'm doing now. And he went and joined the seminary in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. At that time, everything was taught in Latin and German. So the Irish guys were at great disadvantage and several of them kind of flunked out and or couldn't stay because the, the, the German seminarians had the advantage since things were taught in German and Latin. But he went back home. He did a novena. At the end of the novena to Our Lady, he heard the words, go to Detroit. He knew what that meant. He became a Capuchin in Detroit. After 12 years, he struggled academically, but there was a holiness in him that his superior saw. They ordained him after 12 years as a simplex, simplex priest, which meant he couldn't do public homilies or hear confessions, but he humbly uh, submitted to the wills of his superiors, and he became known as kind of a miracle worker. Uh, he was in New York. He worked with altar servers. He was great with young people. There were so many miracles starting to be attributed to his intercession, his prayer life. Um, and just real quick, I'll give you a quick story. He was in Detroit then most of his life. He answered the door at a, at a, at a church there in, in Detroit of the Capuchins. And once there was a priest, and people would line up, even though he just answered the door, they would line up for hours and hours every day to talk to this holy father, Solanus. And he loved to enroll people in the Seraphic Mass Association because he said, all these great graces, they come from the Mass because the Mass is the most important thing we'll ever do in our life is to go to Mass. And so once a, a, one of his fellow Capuchins was leaving with horrible tooth troubles on his way to the dentist, and Father Solanus said, you're going to be just fine. Well, the guy got to the dentist and his teeth were fine. So in gratitude, he bought two ice cream cones. It was the dead of summer. He brought them back to Father Solanus, who was waiting. To, there were tons of people waiting to see him in a hot, unair conditioned uh, building where they were. Father Solanus said, hey, thanks for the ice cream cones. He opened his desk drawer and he laid the ice cream cones in the desk drawer. Several hours later, a family brought a little boy who couldn't walk to see Father Solanus. Father Solanus said, have the young boy walk over to me. And they said, well, Father, he can't walk. He said, sure he can, have him walk over. The kid got up, walked over. Father Solanus said, do you like ice cream? The kid said, I love ice cream. He opened the desk drawer, took out two perfectly preserved ice cream cones and they shared ice cream together. The night before the Detroit auto industry almost collapsed, it was enrolled in the Seraphic Mass Association and they received more orders the next day than any time in history and it saved the city of Detroit. I could go on and on and on. He's a miracle worker. He was named Blessed a couple years ago. But Father Solanus Casey always loved his Irish heritage. He played the fiddle at dances. He was a very fair fiddler. So there's great hope for any of us in traditional Irish music. If we're not where we want to be, um, we're in good company. Well, we're in very good company. Like Matthew is an All-Ireland winner for his local GA club for the All-Ireland score. Great acting and dancing and all that and playing the fiddle. But we'll hear about them talents another time. Would you pray for us before you go, Eddie? Would you say a prayer sure. for this this apostolate sure. and, and sure. I all the men as well? That. I would love that. Thanks very much. Great. I said, great to see you guys again. 
it'd be a great privilege to, to join you anytime I'm, I'm here at your service. And so um, what I'd like to do is you know, do a little prayer for the Holy Joe's Apostle. And then I would like to end with um, the prayer actually for the Holy Souls. It's called the St. Gertrude Prayer. I'd love to pray it because it's um, it, the, the tradition that goes with it is that every time it's prayed, a thousand souls are released from purgatory and they go to heaven. But the number thousand actually means infinite. So the prayer that we're going to say here in a minute literally could release, who knows, a million souls could go to heaven when we pray this prayer sincerely with great faith. So um, can we? I'll kind of conclude with that as well as just a little spontaneous prayer for all of you. Would that be okay? Fair enough. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we're, we'd like to thank you, and we're very grateful for the gift of life that you've given all of us, and help us to remember to live it in such a way to show our appreciation for this tremendous gift. I ask you to please bless the Apostle of the Holy Joes, um, to pray for Matthew, Dermot, Joe, and their families, and, and Father Connor, who was on, and all the guests who will come on Holy Joes, um, and all the listeners who are listening to this, Please bless all of them and their families. You know all these intentions, and we, we come to you with great faith. But we make this in all our prayers through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. And now if we would pray for the holy souls in purgatory, the prayer goes, Eternal Father, I offer thee the most precious blood of thy divine Son, Jesus, in union with the masses said throughout the world today, for all the holy souls in purgatory and for sinners everywhere, for sinners in the universal church, those within my own home and within my family. And again, with our prayer, if we could put them under the loving mantle of the Blessed Virgin Mary, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Eddie, it's been great having you. Um, thank and you. we're looking forward to the next time you're on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. God bless all you guys. Great, Eddie. Thank you. God bless. God bless everyone. See you later. God bless. Take care. God bless. Bye. If you have any questions, ideas, insights, or contributions you'd like to make to the show, please email us at the Holy Joe's Podcast at gmail.com. That's the Holy Joe's Podcast at gmail.com. <laughs>